Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being here July 10th, 2019 for our RN and Allied Health Lecture. Just a few things before we get started. If you're having any technical difficulties at all, please call us 919-445-1000. Uh, you can also email us uncn at unc.edu. All right, a uh, few preliminaries and then let's get going. Uh, we have our 2020 lecture series planning survey available. Please uh, jot this down right now, unccn.org slash survey. Very simple URL. Only takes a few minutes to go through this. We really count on each and every one of our listeners to fill out this survey so that we can make the best plans possible for 2020 with our series and address uh, your requests for lecturers or topics. So please take time to fill this out. Uh, we've already had a number of you uh, fill this out, but if we can get as many as possible to take care of this, we will uh, be able to do that much better of a job with our planning for the next year. Enough said on that. Uh, we hope that you'll be using Poll Everywhere. Uh, the, the participation that, that you uh, engage in with this lecture makes each and every one of our lectures better. It's all anonymous. If you're using uh, the web, very easy. Just go pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M forward slash U-N-C-C-N. Uh, you'll see the, the questions pop up uh, as we uh, share those. And then at the end, you can type in your questions. We hope you'll be jotting down questions to share with us at the end of this presentation. Uh, if you prefer to just use a phone in texting mode, type in 22333. And then uh, where it says the message field, type in UNCCN. You do that once, you'll get a message back saying join. And then you can put in the letters that correspond with the questions as we go along. And at the end, you can share your questions. But please participate. Uh, we really enjoy having it. And, it. and it makes for a better lecture when you're sharing uh, your answers to the questions and then sharing your questions. Uh, the question that, that we'll start with today is, which of the following statements about radiation oncology is true? And I, I think this is kind of a softball, but uh, go with it, and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll use that as our opening question. A, radiation therapy is never combined with surgery or chemotherapy. So, uh, and B, is radiation therapy can be combined with surgery and or chemotherapy depending on the treatment plan. C, is radiation therapy is always performed with chemotherapy. And D, is radiation therapy is always performed with surgery. So uh, see if you can figure out which one of those four statements is true. If you're using the phone, the corresponding letter, otherwise just on the web. All right, and with that, we are ready to go ahead and meet our guests. So bear with me. There we go. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. So to, uh, to, to my left, uh, we have uh, Jane Kemporelli. Did I get that right? Yes, that's oh, right. Oh, good. And you have an MS, an RN, an OCN, APRN, and an adult nurse practitioner at UNC specializing in radiation oncology. Correct. Great. Yes. And you work mainly with breast cancer patients undergoing radiation. That's true. Correct. All yes. right. And mm -hmm. what's one thing that, that we uh, didn't get from that bio there? Um, I also enjoy swimming. All right. And I like to do that before work many days. Good for you. Good for you. And we also have uh, Mary Fleming Knowles, uh, MSN and ANPC, a graduate of the UNC Chapel Hill School with a BSN and an MSM in adult gerontology NP from UNC Greensboro. So far, so good? Perfect. All right. Worked as an NP uh, in the USPHS for five years, stationed at the federal prison in Butner, North Carolina. Returned to UNC in 2008 uh, in oncology, working with head and neck cancer patients, both in the Department of Medical Oncology and Radiation Oncology. And, uh, whoops, we had to make a, bear with me, minor change there. And for the last five years, worked entirely in radiation oncology, Area of interest with head and neck cancer patients include pain and symptom management and survivorship issues. Yes. And for you, what's what's something that, that we don't have on our on our short bio there? I enjoy traveling and I love to cook. All right, all right. So Jane, Mary, welcome both of you. Thank, Thank you thanks so you. much for being here. Let's thanks take for a look. Us. Uh, seems like we're we're sort of honing in on one particular answer there. How did they do? 
They did great. They don't need the talk. Yes. They don't need the talk. We can all get out of here. Have a, have a great lunch. <laughs> okay, except I think you really do, and I think there's a lot of good information and uh, credit for all of you who are here for credit as well. So, so let's continue. Uh, radiation Oncology one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I'll go ahead and pass the controls over to you, Jane. Thank you. All right, and um, Mary and I thought when we geared this talk, we would design this so that there would be understanding perhaps of uh, the patient that has to go through the process of receiving radiation therapy. However, uh, we always have to take care of a little bit of housekeeping, so we have to do some definitions and I'll go ahead and start getting some of that um, taken care of now so that we can move on. Uh, so, of course, we are talking about radiation oncology, as we said, and a uh, basic definition of radiation, maybe, is uh, that is the clinical and scientific discipline devoted to the management of patients with cancer by ionizing radiation alone or in combination with other treatment modalities, for example, surgery and or chemotherapy. Radiation therapy itself is the process that uses radiation for the treatment of cancer. It is technology intensive. It uses complex and sophisticated equipment, machinery that usually actually costs millions of dollars. The um, expertise of the radiation oncologist, as well as several other disciplines that the patient actually never meets, and those include medical physicists, dosimetrists, the radiation therapist, of course, they do meet, and that is the person who is responsible for pressing the button every day for their radiation. Uh, there is support provided by actual radiology, nursing, engineering technology, radiobiologists, software engineers, and administrators. When we deliver radiation to our patients, we are delivering it usually by defining whether it will be a curative intent or a palliative intent. When we are treating somebody curatively, we are hoping for a long-term survival after treatment because we are attempting to eradicate cells in tumors capable of cell division. Uh, anecdotally, for those of you who are in my age group, it wasn't all that long ago that for um, things like lymphoma, they would be treated with definitive radiation alone as a cure. We were not using all of the chemotherapies at that time, so that would be an example of that. Palliative uh, radiation, which also encompasses a large part of our treatment, is delivered to sort of control the growth of tumor, but it likely will grow again in the future. We do that to alleviate pain, improve quality of life, but when there's not really a chance for curing uh, the patient. However, we have to do the same steps for both of those processes. We have to deliver to the target area, and we always have to be very careful to minimize the damage to the critical structures and the surrounding normal tissues. So just as systemic therapy would be equivalent to chemotherapy and immunotherapy, localized therapy is a radiation therapy. Thanks, Jane. Um, also, what's important is when the radiation is delivered uh, within the patient's cancer trajectory. And this can vary with different cancers, pathology, location, and the individual's treatment goals. I'm going to use some head and neck cancers just to give you an example. For example, um, someone with an HPV or pharynx cancer could undergo definitive therapy with radiation, plus or minus chemo, depending on tumor size and such. Um, if you have someone with a large, we'll say maxillary sinus cancer that is impinging on the eye, they can undergo neoadjuvant radiation to try to reduce the tumor size, to reduce the morbidity of the surgery, and hopefully spare the eye. Also, adjuvant therapy, We'll take the example of someone who has a parotid cancer and they have it surgically removed and then the pathology comes back as high-grade mucoep, which is a rare but aggressive salivary gland cancer. They would then get adjuvant radiation after the surgery. We do give intra-op radiation. We don't do it that often. Um, an example of that would be if someone has a 
recurrent cancer to the neck and they've already got radiation and during surgery the radiation um, oncologists actually come and deliver just one radiation treatment at, to that site. Jane, any examples you want to throw in with the breast cancer patient to kind of define these terms again? Sure. Um, a good example perhaps of neoadjuvant therapy would be a um, patient who presents with a very large chest mass that is um, biopsy proven for breast cancer and it is fixed to the chest wall. The surgeon is not able to um, perform surgery at that point. So we will give them neoadjuvant radiation, sometimes alone or in combination with chemotherapy to attempt to get that patient to surgery. Um, adjuvant therapy is always a standard of care when a woman undergoes a lumpectomy surgery. That's always provided after. Uh, intra-op, there's actually a, a study that we've been trying to um, accrue to at UNC where if someone is going to have a lumpectomy and there will be t tissue rearrangement done during the surgery, we're considering doing some intra-op radiation um, to deliver what's called the boost, which is a dose that's delivered at the end of radiation while they're in the operating room and thereby not delivering it at the end of radiation. Thanks. And these are terms that that are probably familiar to you all, but just to kind of put it in context with radiation specifically. Mm -hmm. so also what is helpful for you to know are the vocabulary that we use in radiation. Radiation, the, the dose is, is um, the dose of radiation is called gray. So to put it very simply, using myself an example, Mary received 2 gray or 200 centigray of radiation today. She is to get 2 gray out of prescribed 60 gray. So it's just, it's just a prescription. Uh, as far as the actual radiation treatment, we call these fractions. So Mary should get 35 fractions, aka 35 radiation treatments over a seven week course. Simulation scan is the planning session which is done to start the radiation planning and we're going to go over that in just a moment. In fact, let's see right here. Oh, um, as the slide says, most of you working with people with cancer are going to be working with someone who has undergone radiation or will need to have radiation. It is used either alone or combination with chemotherapy or surgery in over 75% of people undergoing cancer treatment. Yep. All right, and with that we have our first Poll Everywhere question. So let's take a look and see which of the following is not used in radiation oncology. Mm -hmm. And so if you at the first is curative, intent is of long-term survival after treatment, and that's A. B, palliative, improve quality of life by reducing or relieving symptoms. C, combines expertise of radiation oncologists, medical physicists, uh, dosimetrists, dosimetrists, and radiation therapists. Or D, a type of cancer treatment that uses one or more anti-cancer drugs. Uh, we already had a number of folks uh, on this one. How are yes. they doing? They continue to perform. Great, um, great. We, we, top we, oh, there's a C in there. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> it's anonymous. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Uh, we'll, we'll wait just a few more seconds okay. for anyone else who, who wants to take okay. a moment to answer that. And uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Okay. okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, as Mary already said, we use a simulation, which your patient is uh, determined to um, be recommended for radiation therapy. They're going to come for a planning appointment, which is called a simulation. Then uh, they will get set up for that, and uh, radiation will be planned. But it's very mysterious because no one can see it, no one can touch it, no one can feel it, really. Some people think they feel it. Uh, so no one really understands how does it work. So uh, there's two actions of the way radiation works. It can act directly or indirectly. What it really is, is uh, it's attacking the DNA 
So there will be direct uh, cell kill of the actual tumor, or there will be damage, which is considered indirect damage, damage to the DNA so that the cell cannot replicate. And if we go all the way back and we remember our biology, we will recall that cells are in constant division. And this is why we give radiation on a daily basis, because each day the radiation is hitting these cells that have cancer or the potential to cause them in a different uh, facet of, re of replication. And that is how we get our actual um, control of cancer. There are several uh, ways that we can deliver radiation therapy. The most common uh, that we use at UNC and most other radiation centers are via external beam radiation therapy. And that is delivered using what's called the linear accelerator. And that's what most of your patients would be receiving their radiation on. And a linear accelerator, we do have a picture of to show you uh, later in the slides. It's also, we, we commonly call it a LINAC. And uh, it is, a machine that delivers radiation via either photons or electrons. And photons are what is most commonly used for most patients getting external beam radiation therapy. And photons are just something that have a relatively uh, deep penetration into the tissues. Electrons are also commonly used. Um, so electrons, think of something like someone that has a skin cancer, perhaps that has to be radiated. We might use electrons. It's a very shallow um, depth of treatment. It doesn't need to go all the way through to uh, some point, you know, be deeper in the body because it's something that's only surface that's being treated. Uh, so we use that, and we, we will often use a combination of both of those during someone's radiation treatment. Now we have another fancy machine called the CyberKnife that had been located in the uh, main hospital but now has been moved to our department. And the CyberKnife is a, um, another external machine that delivers very precise radiation. And all of our machines deliver radiation very precisely. But this is a machine that delivers hundreds of pencil point beams to a very small target area. So in our external beam radiation therapy, somebody will be receiving small doses every day over a long period of time. When someone is receiving CyberKnife radiation therapy, they will be receiving a very large dose of radiation over a very small period of time, which is usually anywhere from one to five fractions. Additionally, uh, another radiation machine that you have probably started to hear quite a bit about, and these machine centers are popping up all over the United States and maybe popping up in uh, the state of North Carolina <laughs> very soon, uh, that is called protons. And protons are delivered via a cyclotron, and that's a charged particle that deposits over a narrow range of depth. Depth is important because the proton is able to deliver the radiation right to the tumor and not necessarily have an exit as a um, linear accelerator would have. So there is less scatter. Protons are going to be or are already very, um, very big in terms of pediatric cancers where we worry about uh, long-term side effects. Since there's no exit dose, we are um, less concerned with long-term side effects for the children, of course. And, and then a uh, different type of radiation that we have and we commonly use at UNC is something called brachytherapy. And brachytherapy is the actual delivery of the radioactive sources which are sealed into a uh, select cavity of the body, i.e. a um, prostate or in cases of females that perhaps are having um, cervical cancer treatment, we can deliver a large dose of radiation to the pelvis, but we become limited after a time with the bowel and bladder. But if someone actually places some brachytherapy after the external beam radiation therapy, uh, we can deliver further dose into the cervix area, thereby giving more curative treatment. And regarding CyberKnife, an example of that that most people have heard of are for brain mets, yes. um, used for brain mets. Uh, but it also can be used outside of the brain. It can be used um, if someone has a very small 
cancer to their liver. Uh, it can be used to other parts of the body. It can be used to, to the bone. There's a very small cancer even to the spinal cord. So it is used in those cases as well. Yes. So again, you have a patient. They're going to need radiation. What's the first step? The first step after the consult is a CT simulation, and we have addressed this uh, before. This is a scanner that's in our department. It looks like a CT scanner, and it actually is. Um, so they come and to our department and undergo this CT simulation where they are actually going to be simulated in the exact position that they need to be when they get radiation. So Mary went back. There we go. So why do we simulate? We simulate because, as Jane touched on, radiation has to be absolutely accurate. It needs to be precise. We want to get to the tumor as much as possible and avoid critical structures, avoid damaging anything outside of the, outside of the tumor. So the patient needs to be set up every day the same way to deliver it like this. Mm -hmm. It's also for patient comfort. Um, if someone is, say, short of breath and they can't lay, di lay, lay down, we simulate them uh, on a board so that they can be in a more of an upright position. Uh, they do get a tattoo. Our patients do get tattoos uh, for the simulation, and it's very, very small. And it is permanent. It and is. even when we tell them it's permanent, they ask if it's permanent. People forget. And it is permanent. And, and it's very small. This is an example of two individuals undergoing a simulation. Uh, the woman is probably having breast or lung cancer being treated, so this is not an uncommon uh, position for someone to be in, and the person on the right probably has a head and neck cancer, and they are being treated, uh, they're being set up, uh, again, so that they can replicate this position every time they undergo radiation. And we have an example of the mask that our patients have to wear. It is soft when they put it on them, and then it, oh, touch it, then it hardens. And it's actually bolted, bolted down to, to, the, to the structure, to the gurney. It's a little hot in that mask. It, 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 yeah. well, it's a little claustrophobic. And again, <laughs> and this is all to ensure the radiation is being delivered accurately. Uh, treatment planning, oh, treatment planning is from the time the simulation is done. And we actually have some, some pictures, I think, later to show yes. you what treatment plan looks like. Yeah. That it is then taken to all those people we mentioned before, dosimetrists, medical physicists, the radiation oncologist, all work to develop the particular treatment plan unique to that individual. They come up with the doses that are going to get to the tumor, doses that are going to get to surrounding tissue, and then they also come up with a number of treatments, which is called number of fractions, you all know that now, dose per fraction, and they come up with the energy and total dose that Jane had touched on. Mm -hmm. And this procedure can take one to two weeks. So uh, once that information is transported uh, electronically into the planning systems, this um, someone draws out what's called the contours. And the contours are just sort of anatomic structures that are nearby, including the tumor. And we have this slide in just to show you. Um, this is sort of our example of... You know, everyone know, wants to know, how do we know you're getting it? How, you know, how do we know it's going to the right place? And I, I use the example of the surgeon who um, performs surgery. They take the tumor out, but they also have to get the negative surrounding margins if they can. Well, in radiation, we have something similar. So in the center, if you think of that as the tumor or the tumor bed from someone who has been resected, that's what's called our gross tumor volume. Then surrounding that area, we have what's called a clinical target volume, which would be um, our, say, surgical margins. 
different types of tumors, depending on their behaviors, et cetera, there are certain designated margins that should be placed around each uh, area that we want to treat that the radiation oncologist is comfortable with knowing that uh, is likely going to um, capture any sort of microscopic disease that may be lurking at those edges. Additionally, there's something called a planning target volume. So you saw when the patients were, when that woman was in the picture having her um, uh, mold made, that uh, she had her arms up in the air and she was sort of held in place. Well, that's very nice, but it is extremely difficult for people to hold still. And in things like the chest, you know, we have necessary functions such as breathing, and when we breathe, things can move, tumors move up and down, and you know, that can happen as well in the rest of the body. So we also have to account for what's called the planning target volume, and all of that goes into the designing of the actual radiation field that will uh, be treated, and that all comes into what's called the treated and the irradiated volume. So this is an example of um, an axial view of someone's pelvis that has gone over to sort of the planning system. And often um, when our dosimetrists and our physicists are working on radiation plans, they may work on more than one plan um, because they want to get the best possible treatment to the area that we intend to treat as well as minimizing, you know, uh, treatment to the surrounding structures. So in this case, uh, this is someone who has prostate cancer, which is in the center, and there have been two plans made. One is sort of a standard plan, and the other is something called IMRT. And IMRT is something that's able to weight the actual radiation beams into the area, whereby they can um, say, uh, like those uh, so I'm talking about the one on the right where it sort of looks like a little peace sign. They can weight those three beams a little more heavily than the two sort of wings on the outside versus the one on the left where all of those beams are kind of weighted the same going in. And they'll look at those and they'll see the surrounding areas, which are um, bones or what we can see quite well there. They will decide which one looks better. Because ultimately radiation can, in, in this case, we can cause some uh, damage to the bones as well. So that, that's what's all going on during the planning phase. These are some further examples of the planning system. And you can see some sagittal views, axial views, um, anterior, posterior, and then some 3D pictures. And that's um, sort of placed up there, spun around. It's taken a look at and the actual... Um, team decides, are they happy with how that looks? Has that minimized the uh, treatment to the surrounding tissues well enough? And are we okay to go ahead and take care of the patient? Additionally, we use this. This is, might be a little hard to see, but it's something called a dose volume histogram. And this is prepared when someone is going to undergo radiation treatment. And the actual, what's called uh, it looks red to me. Hopefully it looks red to you from there, too. It says GTV. That's the gross tumor volume. This is an example for a head and neck case where the gross tumor volume, of course, would be the head and neck cancer. But what is also surrounding that area in this case is the spinal cord, the parotid glands on both sides. And um, a graph is actually made to see what are the doses to those surrounding structures and are they acceptable and uh, while at the same time covering the gross tumor. So the red line up on the top on the graph is actually at 100, which means that uh, they have been successful in getting full treatment to the gross tumor. And then those bottom lines, which are sort of magenta, blue, and gray, um, or perhaps green, um, relate to those other areas, such as the parotid glands, uh, the cord, et cetera. And did they meet acceptable tolerance to there? And that all has to be okayed by the radiation oncologist and really sort of the physicist as well to make sure that we are okay to go ahead with that plan. So now that all these people have done this work, as you can see, computers and machines are a big part of the radiation oncology department. This is actually a radiation machine, what Jane had called the LINAC, the linear nuclear, the linear accelerator. Um, 
there's this round, you see a round disc on the floor that can, that can uh, turn around to, to move the table. The arm of the machine also can turn. This is like a cross section of the machine and the treatment head is actually where the radiation comes out. All those, those, those uh, treatment plans that you saw, all those 3D images are, are computer generated and, and put into this machine. And um, the, uh, you know, the machine is relatively, for all what's going on inside of it, the machine is relatively quiet, but all mm -hmm. that energy is turning up inside of there to place that beam that comes out through the treatment head. And that will be um, designed to the actual shape of the tumor as well. So this is also a, a machine, and you can see how it's turned. The pictures on the, on the bottom are of the treatment head. And we'll go to the next slide. And these are, that's, that's a close-up version of it. These are multi-leaf collimator. It is, most of our machines have this. And those little lead leaves actually conform, conform uh, unique, based on the patient's plan, to dispense the radiation. Some patients, anyone would get upset when the machines are down or delayed or are or, or, or broken. But another of the safety safety safeguards is if one of these leaves doesn't go in the right spot or is stuck, the entire machine shuts down. Again, just another safeguard. But it shows you how precise this radiation can be delivered. Mm -hmm. This is called a port film. It also is another safeguard to ensure the radiation is being delivered accurately. And what happens is uh, these films are taken every week on every patient, and the usually it's the attending physician corresponds, compares that film to the one that was done at simulation to ensure that they match up exactly right. Give you an example, the port film can change. Uh, you may have someone who loses, say, 50 pounds under treatment, and all of a sudden, their port film, it looks very different than the simulation scan, and someone actually has to be re-simulated during treatment to ensure that they're given the right dose. And we, do th we also do these port films uh, before someone actually starts radiation, yeah. and we make sure that that plan that was designed does actually work. They will go through a dry run of all of this treatment with these images taken before the radiation is actually delivered. If we can't see, oh, sorry, I was just going to add if if we can't see the cancer, um, let's say you know a person has no neck nodes uh, that are positive and it's, it's very small larynx cancer. People often ask, well, how do you know it's working? How do you know it's working? And a common thing we say is. Well, you're lining up accurately, and it's being delivered exactly as we planned. We feel like we know it's working. Can we see tumor growth you know, on these? You, you can see tumor growth, but some patients think we're actually checking to see if the tumor is regressing with these port films. And really all we're doing, not all, but the main, the main thing is to make sure that the patient's lined up accurately. Right. We, we have to remind the patients a lot of the time, remember your cancer has already been taken out. This is it being has, done yeah. for the risk of microscopic disease. In most any study that has ever been done, radiation decreases the risk of local recurrence. So we do know there is microscopic disease. Does everybody have it? No, but we don't know who has it and who doesn't. So that's why we are the standard of care most of the time in a lot of these adjuvant settings. Mm -hmm. All right, and our next Poll Everywhere question, which of the following is not used in radiation therapy? And so if you believe that is linear, accel a linear accelerator, you'll put A. Multi-leaf culminator would be B. Port film C. Or uh, phoretic analyzer would be D. Again. Yes. Yep. There you yes. are. Yes, 100%. Right there. Absolutely. This is like Jeopardy, then. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot of money to go out. Nobody, nobody uh, told us about that. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll move on then. Um, 
So your patients uh, who are undergoing radiation want to know their treatment schedule, and we say this uh, ad nauseum. It's every day, Monday through Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They get the weekends off and usually the holidays off as well. Uh, the treatment schedule will vary. Uh, sometimes one treatment, sometimes five treatment if it's palliative, all the way up to seven weeks for a curative head and neck or a prostate cancer patient. Okay. So, yeah. What you what we really want to what what we kind of focus on my, the most in our clinic are treatment side effects. Yes, and this is the thing you'll hear most about from the patients. So your patient has already gone through their simulation. They've had uh, that planning appointment done. Their plan works, and now they're actually under treatment. So they're going to start experiencing some side effects at some point. And usually, none of this happens right away. It will start a few weeks in. Now, no matter what site is getting radiated, there are side effects that are inherent to all aspects of radiation. And those three are fatigue, hair loss, and skin changes. So we have mainly focused on those. Um, so number one, fatigue. Some of you may oh, recognize this. You may yeah. be working with this person. Fatigue, we don't, we don't know why radiation really causes fatigue. There's some thought that it's a release of cytokines. That seems to where, be where the current um, literature is, but we're still not exactly sure. So um, all we can do is try to combat it. And ONS had even come out with PEP cards about fatigue. The biggest thing we probably tell the patients is try to keep continuing to do their daily routine that they already have in place. They're going to get fatigued. It's a matter of how fatigued they will get. If one is diagnosed with cancer and they take to the bed, they're going to be exhausted. If you're uh, continuing to try to do your exercise routine, by the time you finish radiation, you will be tired. You'll also be sick of us because you've been coming every day for a while. Uh, you may be going to bed a little earlier at night. You may be taking a nap here and there, but it otherwise shouldn't be worse than that. If somebody's fatigue is really severe, then sometimes we have to look at other things, like other etiologic factors. Uh, you know, breast patients, for example, when we're radiating them and they've had chemotherapy, they're coming in often anemic. And that is being, um, you know, that's improving as treatment is going on, but it's still there. So there are other things. We tell them to make sure they get good sleep at night, try to do some relaxation, yoga, massage, healing touch, those type of things. They're likely to be effective. Um, but uh, the tincture of time is usually going to fix it. Yeah, and regarding fatigue, I like to tell patients your body is running a marathon at a cellular level, running a marathon. If you were to sit all day long, you would still lose weight, you would still be tired. And certainly I think exercise more and more in both people undergoing cancer treatment and as they move on to survivorship, we know that exercise is one of the best things that, that people can do. Mm -hmm. Hair loss. Uh, a lot of people concerned with hair loss. They will experience hair loss, but only if it's in the treatment field. Um, for example, uh, our head and neck cancer patients, they will get some beard loss under treatment. It is usually not permanent, uh, but if they're undergoing esophageal cancer, they're not going to lose their beard. Um, the hair will frequently come back, frequently come back, uh, although at certain doses, hair does not grow back. Uh, sometimes with whole brain that are getting 30, 40, 50 gray, they may have permanent hair loss. Skin reactions. Uh, this is the most common reaction that we see in radiation and that you will see as people, as those that work with people with radiation. They can be one of the most distressing symptoms that, that patients and their families experience. I think because it's right there, they see it all the time, it's very scary. You know, if you have a burn, you don't go and keep burning it and essentially when we see radiation, when we see skin reactions, we continue treating. Um, the skin, you know, is the first thing that takes a hit. 
And so it is, reactions can be quite profound. We do not like to put people on radiation breaks because as Jane uh, mentioned earlier, people come every day, they need to get it every day to a prescribed dose. We will sometimes have to give people a break if their, ra if their radiation dermatitis is too much, but we as radiation providers really have a high tolerance to accept a lot of skin reaction. But again, it can be very concerning to, to patients um, and to their family. Dry desquamation, I think most people know what that is. It's scaling and peeling and I have pictures and then we have moist de desquamation as well, mm -hmm. which is grade three. We call it grade three radiation dermatitis. Mm -hmm. So uh, some pictures? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, this is yep, what we would call grade two radiation dermatitis. Absolutely expected. Would not need to do anything but good skin care, which we'll talk about. And the patient is probably getting a little uncomfortable yes, at this point. Yes, a little point, uncomfortable. But yeah. we're looking at them and we're going, oh, it looks good. <laughs> and they look at us and go, really? Yeah, so nope, it does. Looks right. This is when we start to get unpopular. Yeah, this is dry desquamation. Um, again, we might add Silvadine. I'm going to talk about some, some creams. But really, we keep on going. If someone develops a secondary infection, certainly we would treat them for that. And if you look at the neck, uh, in the middle of the neck, you can actually see a hypopigmentated line. That is where radiation is not being delivered for, for, for reasons like we're avoiding the larynx or whatever. I don't know this person. But it's, you can see that is how accurate the radiation is, that people will often have this clear delineation of where radiation is ending. This is wet desquamation. Again, would not stop radiation based on this. Uh, and we'll talk about how to, how to care for these folks. Skin care. Um, the important thing is good, gentle care. Gentle cleaning. No scrubbing. And keep it moisturized. The th one of the questions I'm asked routinely every day, multiple times a day, what cream do you suggest? I suggest the cream that they have with them and that they're going to use liberally. Now, we prefer it to be non-fragranced, and mm -hmm. I think, is that, or is that, you got it next, yeah, skin, mm -hmm. Aquaphor, Eucerin, any cream that is non-fragrance, you can use. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of literature on, on certain creams. Truly, Use non-fragrance and just use it a lot. Uh, calendula is also very good. You can try soothing things such as green tea bags. Uh, aloe vera is very soothing. Doesn't provide a lot of moisture, but it's very soothing. So certainly people can use it. Uh, you can give steroids, uh, anti-inflammatory if they're having their rectal region uh, radiated. Uh, Silvadine is probably the most prescribed cream that we give, and it would be for grade two, certainly grade three radiation der dermatitis. Mm -hmm. Mucositis uh, also is is a major issue, but only if the mouth is in the in in the radiation field. So certainly, I see this in every patient. It's we see it in people who have head and neck cancers uh, and also esophageal cancers. Our mainstay are this, the saline soda water rinses. We, they can certainly go buy some non-alcohol products, but the saline soda water rinse 10 to 12 times a day we find to be the most effective rinse over anything in the market. You can have prescription uh, mouthwashes as well, such as Magic Mouthwash, Duke's Magic Mouthwash, UNC has something called BLM, also called First Aid Mouthwash. It's Benadryl, Lidocaine, Mylanta. Lidocaine is very helpful to the mucositis. Uh, as far as viscous lidocaine, they can swish it in their mouth and help the, uh, the pain of the lesions, which is the primary problem. And analgesics, opioids, non-inflammatory agents, 
These are a mainstay of our patients, and it's a big part of uh, certainly what I do on a daily basis is pain management. Since baths, if someone is having uh, uh, being treated for rectal cancer, uh, cervical vaginal cancers, sits pads are very, very soothing. You know, we we know a lot. We don't know everything. Patients get advice from from their pastor at church, from people all around them. We just ask that they talk to us before they use it. It may be perfectly fine, something I've never heard of, and say, sure, try it. Coconut oil. Some people like to to take a spoonful of coconut oil and put it in their mouth and swish it around. Perfectly fine. Just talk to their provider first. All right. And another question. Uh, which of the following is most effective in dealing with radiation therapy, including fatigue? And if you think that's A, sleep well at night, B, rest during the day, C, exercise, or D, reduce caffeine and alcohol consumption. And I'll put in a plug. We've had some great lectures here from uh, Dr. Bottiglini and Dr. Mm -hmm. Wood oh, yeah. and others mm -hmm. regarding uh, the, the benefits of oh, exercise yes. during mm -hmm. and after yeah, he's uh, great. cancer he's treatments. Some great literature here. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's a correct answer, of course, again. Yes, yes. again. Good, yes. good. Way to go. Very good, everyone. All right. Um, we'll, we'll just hit on this to make you aware that there are non-oncological reasons to get radiation. Uh, prevention of heterotopic ossifications, this is to prevent scar tissue after someone has had a hip replacement. There's tumors called glomus tumors, uh, also known as paragangliomas. Uh, we give radiation for those. Keloids. Uh, in the post-operative setting, we give keloids. It's three treatments right after surgery, trigeminal neuralgia, very painful condition. Radiation can be helpful in that. Chordomas, and then endocrine uh, orbito, orbito orbitopathy. <laughs> that's a hard one for me. Um, these are patients with Graves' disease that have severe proptosis and uh, it can be quite profound and disabling, and radiation is helpful for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you're taking care of somebody who's going to be undergoing radiation, and um, or if someone is referred for radiation, there are some hard stops in place that we have to know about before we embark on radiation. If someone has a pacemaker or a defibrillator, it can be a major issue because radiation can damage the pacemaker defibrillator. Um, we have, they have to have cardiology clearance first before they start. Sometimes we've had to have the pacemaker moved if it's in this field. And, you know, is it a pacemaker that's on demand? Is it, you know, constantly firing? You know, these are all issues. In some cases, we have actually not radiated people because of the location of that. Also, autoimmune disorders, we can aggravate that. You know, it's important to know things like uh, Crohn's disease, etc. Have they had a prior history of radiation? That has to be taken into account. Everybody thinks that if you've had radiation before to an area, you can't have it again. We are an academic center. We have re-irradiated people very often. It is done differently the second time around. We usually lower the dose and we might do it twice a day instead of daily, but it is a definite, um, it is a definite process that we have to look at. Some patients that have claustrophobia, you saw that mask before. We've had people literally get that mask on and say, absolutely not, I can't be radiated. And then we have often had to get medication and CCSP on board. There have even been a couple of people who have had to be uh, fully sedated. I think you've had some head and neck patients who had to have full sedation for yes, radiation. Yes, that had um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. And they uh, were brought back to some very unpleasant places and they could not tolerate it. And of course, most pediatric patients are sedated. Mm -hmm. People with mobility issues if they can't get into the treatment position and social situations. You know, you have to come every day, so you have to be able to get here, um, which can be a big deal. Mm -hmm. So we talked about how long it, it, it can take to, to, to start radiation from the consult, simulation, planning, and start of radiation. However, there are oncological emergencies in which case the radiation is planned and started very quickly. Patient is consulted on that day as an inpatient. 
they are simulated that day, and they start radiation that day. These are conditions you all may be familiar with, spinal, um, malignant spinal cord compression. We certainly would prefer to start radiation before there's neurological damage, because once that damage is already present, rarely does dysfunction return. Um, but that is a common reason for emergent radiation, superior vena cava syndrome. We've been called into the recovery room to evaluate people right after uh, they were found to have a huge mass uh, impeding their, their the mediastinum. Their mediastinum, yeah, their airway and their uh, vasculature. Excessive bleeding. Uh, what comes to mind are vaginal uh, tumors that are causing a huge amount of blood loss, and we can radiate them very quickly to, to slow down the bleeding and intramedullary spinal cord metastases. Uh, just things that you should know about the hospitalized patient receiving radiation. Uh, if you're the nurse taking care of that person or is the um, therapist, what, whatever, who might be involved, you want to know, um, you know, before they come down, if they're under active treatment. Are they? Are they stable or are they not stable? What time is the radiation? Is it daily? Is it twice a day? If they're not under active treatment, how recently did they complete radiation? Are they still receiving side effects? Who is their radiation oncologist? Mm -hmm. What site is being treated? What are the side effects? And are they getting chemotherapy with radiation? And what type of chemotherapy? Have we treated people uh, in the ICU that are looked that critically ill as the person on the right we have? Uh, but again, it would be for an emergent issue. If that person, say, got sick while under treatment, and was this, was this sick, they would unfortunately have to get a radiation break. So treatment's finished, patient bangs the gong, and they feel better. Not exactly. It can take weeks for them to start to feel better. Um, just like, again, if you all work with cancer patients, you know this recovery trajectory can be quite long, as I told a patient this morning, you're in what I would say is the acute phase of recovery. You're still on pain meds, you're not eating well, and then you're going to recover even more in a couple weeks. I also remind people you had six, seven weeks of treatment, you're going to need six, seven weeks to recover. The fatigue is one of uh, fatigue in, in, in the patients I see, and certainly taste changes, those are two of the things that I see very slow to return. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating to patients. Yep. Yeah. So that is a brief introduction into radiation oncology. Yep. We thank you for viewing. Absolutely, and hope you have some questions for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Let me, if I could get the mm -hmm. keyboard sure, so there, we'll go ahead and move over to the uh, screen for questions. Uh, so this is your opportunity. Uh, we, we have a, about six, seven minutes left. So please share your questions with, with our guests, Jane and Mary. Um, I had one to start while we're waiting for others to come in. You mentioned uh, with palliative care towards the beginning, talking mm -hmm. about um, sometimes using radiation to manage uh, the, the, some of the effects of, of the cancer. How do you balance too much, too little, because you're, you're managing if effects of cancer with something that has its own side effects and what what's the what sorts of uh, uh, factors go into that decision making about what's too much too little and and when does it do more more harm than good mm -hmm. it, it is balance I mm -hmm. think a, a good discussion with the patient and the family to help define their treatment goals is absolutely crucial mm -hmm. um, for example let's say someone has really good local control three years after head and neck cancer treatment and they've developed a bone net. Mm -hmm. um, they have one, and that's their only site of disease. We would tend to be quite aggressive with that bone net. Mm -hmm. um, but when someone is, you know, palliative means to, to ease, to mm -hmm. palliate a symptom. Palliative care doesn't mean it's end-of-life care. They mm -hmm. are there are some nuances with that, sure. but it is it is a discussion. Uh, sometimes we start patients with treatment and say, you know, you can stop if things become too tough, if we're just trying to palliate something. It's an ongoing discussion. Gotcha. Thank you so much for, for the additional detail on that. All right, our first question from our audience. What site typically experiences the most side effects, and what are they? Good question. 
That is um, a good question. It is a good question. It's uh, I'll give you I'll give a couple of examples. Um, brain radiation is the most fatiguing of all the radi of all the radiation treatment that we give. I would say probably marry the head and neck patients. Um, the thick ropey saliva, the dry mouth, et cetera. That's really significant. Significant. And 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 why why does the mucosa get such a hit? Well, because it literally, like if you can imagine, if you have a tonsil cancer, your entire oral cavity and oropharynx is getting radiation. Those are rapidly dividing cells, mm -hmm. and so they will have a lot of cell turnover. So that's why they get so profound. Now, again, you get... You're getting your um, uh, prostate radiated. You're not going to have mucositis. You'll have other issues there. The uh, additionally, if you're a lung cancer patient, you have to have your mediastinum treated usually, and those lymph nodes live in the center of the chest, right by the esophagus. They experience very significant difficulty swallowing. Mm -hmm. I think skin-wise, I I skin. I might be biased, but I'd say that the breast probably has the most significant um, reactions there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if, you know, you're down in the pelvis, um, these vulvar cancers, they get very significant skin reactions yeah. as well. Um, I, I might grab that second one. Yeah, question. you grab the second one. Uh, early stage lung cancer tumor. Have you tried to use XRT to eradicate the tumor? Yes, we do it almost every day. And uh, that's usually used with the cyber knife. And it actually is quite uh, successful. Mm -hmm. All right. Great question. We, mm -hmm. we have uh, just another minute or two if you'd like to uh, share any other questions with our guests. Um, you had mentioned an, uh, the, the proton, uh, yes. and, and what, what, what's the future of that look like? Yeah, we don't currently have one here at UNC Chapel We do not. The nearest uh, one is in the state of Virginia, I believe. Mm -hmm. We are tentatively, I'm pretty sure, getting one. Mm -hmm. It will be a few years. It's a large project and we will be getting one great yeah and I'm not sure if you mentioned but but I believe we do it at a UNC Chapel Hill have something for uh, if a patient is receiving radiation very near the heart that will will see that that if that patient moves too much or breathes in or out too much that will cease the the radiation the the dispersal of the radiation is that right the, uh, are you referring to the breath hole, perhaps? Uh, yes. 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 Mm -hmm. we, yep. uh, so that is a f uh, fancy adaption that we have on the machine where we can, um, you can imagine that if I take a deep breath, I expand my chest out, that drops my heart back, mm -hmm. and we can design radiation treatments so that the machine delivers the radiation only when someone is in that deep breath. Gotcha. And as soon as they release the machine will stop the uh, treatment. They usually have to hold their breath about 15, 20 seconds. Um, and we've done some studies on that. Actually, our chairman, Dr. Marks, um, that has really been his area of study. Mm -hmm. And he was ahead of this game before even the fancy machinery came in. But we do use yeah. that. Very good. Question up there, lots of diarrhea with pelvic treatments. Absolutely. The, the yeah. bowel is right there in the treatment field. There's sometimes no getting around it. Certainly, again, you're you're trying to get the best plan you can to get that tumor and to avoid bowel toxicities, and then supportive care to manage the diarrhea. Right. Not not the time to go on your uh, high fiber diet. Gotcha. No. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And then and then last question we have time for. Uh, you mentioned that there is no exit. Uh, for proton therapy, what happens to the irradiated protons? Do these remain in the body? It, Interesting question. Mm -hmm. that, that is, there's a rapid fall off on the protons, and uh, it's. I wouldn't. There is a scatter. It eventually yeah. dissipates. There's yes. nothing that they would be actually ra uh, radioactive of, but it's it's it relates to like the the half life of the uh, fall off, oh, and fall off, yeah. that's why there is not the. Um, there's no concerns about what's going on in their body or the, you know, the other side of the beam. 
All right. Well, thank you for that clarification. And thank you for, to our audience for all the thank great you, questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, a few things to mention. We want to thank uh, the, the North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support uh, through the University Cancer Research Fund. We want to thank uh, UNC Lineberger Comprehensive mm -hmm. Cancer Center. Mm -hmm. We want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the work they do for this and every one of our lectures. Mm -hmm. uh, we have more lectures coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, Best of ASCO 2019, uh, Breast and Gastrointestinal Cancer. Uh, with Dr. McGree and Dr. Ray. Uh, that's coming up on July 24th at noon, August 14th, The Many Roads of Esophageal Cancer uh, with Dr. Aurora and Kathleen Farrell. So we're looking forward to uh, both of those. Mm -hmm. And then we've got more self-paced lectures. All of our lectures go into our learning portal mm -hmm. where they can be taken for up to a year. Uh, the, the newest ones there, the role and importance of HPV infection in head and neck cancer and prostate cancer screening are both available. Mm -hmm. uh, cancer Conversations is Organic Really Better, Eating Well for Good Health with Jennifer Spring, mm -hmm. and then uh, Get Started with Exercise with Claudio Badaglini, who we mentioned earlier. Oh, yes. We hope you'll be able to join us for those as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned a link earlier on. Uh, all of our lectures are free, but once in a while we ask for just one or, or two favors. Uh, th this month we're asking you to go to unccn.org slash survey. Please take that survey. That really helps us out. And the thing we ask each lecture each month is please spread the word about these free and valuable lectures to your friends and colleagues. And uh, the more people we can get to watch these, uh, the more uh, we have the ability to share this valuable information. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all. Until the next lecture. Thank, thank you. you so much. And Jane, thank you. We thank really you appreciate much. it. Mary, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been great. For having us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It was a pleasure.